Hi, Bayless Connolly here. I've got something to share with you that can absolutely revolutionize your life. It'll change everything for you spiritually. It'll bring answers to you that otherwise seem to be out of reach. So, uh, hey, why don't you sit down with me and let's get into the Word together. Secondly, we move to walking. And I'll just quote it to you, 2 Corinthians 5 and 7. It says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. In context, it's talking about us waiting and till our redemption is complete and Christ returns and we get our new glorified bodies. In the meantime, we walk by faith. We walk by the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11.1 1 gives that definition of faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Well, standing may have to deal with, you know, trusting God and, and wrapping ourselves in a promise in the midst of a particular storm, but walking deals with what we do daily, how we live out our faith day by day. We walk by faith. Look with me in the book of Romans, if you would, chapter 4. Romans, the fourth chapter. And here it talks about Abraham, who more than any other individual, barring the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. But Abraham is set forth as someone to follow when it comes to faith. And this verse makes it eminently clear. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, it says that we should follow the footsteps of Abraham's faith. Romans 4 and verse 12 says, So then each of us, Excuse me, I'm in the wrong chapter. That was a good verse, but it was the wrong verse. <laughs> Romans 4, 12. And the father of circumcision to those who are not only of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. We're to walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had. One translation says we should follow the footprints of Abraham's faith. And you know, the Bible very specifically in the New Testament tells us several aspects of Abraham's faith. You could say it this way, that there are several very distinct footprints that Abraham's faith has left in the sands of time. And we're to follow them. And I just want to look at three of those footprints briefly here. If we're to walk by faith, well, we need to put our feet in these same footprints and walk the same way. Hebrews chapter 11. Would you look at these with me quickly? The first one we'll call the footprint of obedience. Hebrews 11 and verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And when he went out not knowing where he was going. God didn't give him a road map. God didn't tell him where he'd end up. God just said, go, and I'll lead you. You can read the story in Genesis 12 later on your own time. God said, leave your family, leave your kindred, leave your city. Leave everything, leave your life. And go to a land that I will show you. And if you do that, Abraham, I'll make your name great. I'll bless you, and you'll be a blessing. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. And so Abraham went out in obedience, not knowing where he was going, not knowing what was going to happen next. And I know some people, it's like, well, well you know, I, I've got to know, or I, I just can't go. You'll never get far with God. He doesn't work that way. God gives you a step. He doesn't give you a map. And we're to walk in the footprints of Abraham's faith. Some of you may be right there. You don't know what's coming next. Now, this was not presumption on Abraham's part. Notice it says, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out. He didn't just, you know, get out on a limb and start sawing it off, say, okay, God, you have to catch me. He had a very distinct call, a very distinct leading. Friend, you don't get out of the boat and try and walk on the water unless he says, come. Otherwise, bring your bathing suit because you're going to need it. 
And over the years, I cannot tell you how many people I've watched climb out on a limb, say, well, so-and-so did it. It worked for them, so it'll work for me. God, here I come. Bring some bandages. You'll need them. Now, Abraham, when he was called, went out. He didn't know everything that was going to happen, and God will give you a step. And sometimes you're thinking, but God, he'll guide you once you get going. You know, I got saved up in Oregon. I'm a Southern California boy, but sort of lived all over and hadn't really seen the family in four years, and I'd, I'd built somewhat of a life for myself there. And God called me to come back. Now, Abraham was called to leave his family. God told me, go back to your family. And so I left everything that, that I had built and all the relationships and everything that was there, and I came back only knowing I had a sense God was saying, you come back if you obey me, I will bless you. And so I came back, uprooted everything, left my life there completely, and came back here in my old 63 microbus to Southern California. And God has kept his end of the bargain. Some of you, what is it that God is calling you to do? What's he leading you to do? Well, you need to be obedient when you know he's told you to do something. The second footprint we find is what we call the pilgrim's footprint. Verse 9, again, by faith, he dwelt in the land of promises in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Did you know that Abraham and Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, never experienced the fulfillment of the promise to see their posterity, to see their seed as numerous as the stars in the sky or as the sand by the seashore. They lived without ever experiencing the fulfillment of that. Now Abraham, when he left, he left one of the most advanced cities of the ancient world. Ur, Ur the Chaldeans, archaeologists have uncovered it. They had underground sewage systems. They had cobblestone streets. They had multi-level buildings. They had courtyards. It was a center for world trade. And he left that, and the scripture says he went and dwelt in the wilderness in tents. And he spent the rest of his life as a pilgrim looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. He realized he was just a sojourner, and his family lived the same way. In fact, look with me, if you would, in verse... 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they'd called to mind the country from which they'd come out, they would have had opportunity to return. And that country they came out of for Abraham was Ur of the Chaldeans. If he would have called it to mind, if he would have thought nostalgically about it, he would have had many opportunities to return. And I'm telling you, that's why some people in God's family end up going back into the world is because they're always calling to mind the country they've come from. And the devil gives them ample opportunity to return. You know what nostalgia is? It's thinking about all the good times and forgetting all the pain. Yeah, man, we used to rage, we used to party, yeah, and you threw up in the toilet and fell down and broke your front teeth, and <laughs> yeah, you forget about all that part. But when we nostalgically reminisce about what we've came out of, opportunities galore present themselves. And Abraham, one reason he never went back, one reason he stayed steady with God is because he didn't continually call those things to mind, the scripture tells us. Verse 16, but now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he's prepared a city for them and for us as well. Friend, we are strangers in this earth. We're in it, but we're not of it. We're pilgrims. We're passing through. I have a friend who's born in a little Greek village on an island in the Mediterranean Sea. And he would always talk to me about this little village he was raised in and the island he was raised on. He said, Bayless, it's amazing. It's so peaceful. The people are friendly. They don't lock their doors. The food is amazing. There's, there's 
olive trees that are 2,000 years old. There's ancient ruins. The, the, the ocean is, is amazing. The, the, every direction you look, the vistas are, are just breathtaking. He said, you should come sometime. And he talked about it so much, he created a desire in me to go there. And so I told him, I said, we're in. Next time you and your wife go on holiday, we're coming with you. And Janet and I did. We went on a little vacation with them to their island in the middle of the Mediterranean. And we saw the little village that he was born and raised in. And it was everything they said and more. Their house that they have there is on a side of a hill. Next to it is a monastery where there has been unbroken prayer for a thousand years. When I sat down on the steps of their house next to that monastery, the peace and the atmosphere was so tangible that my eyes welled up with tears. To this day, I don't think I've ever sent such a tangible peace in an atmosphere anywhere that I've ever been. But I guess praying for a thousand years might do that. <laughs> well, you know what? I have a homeland. And I just wonder, the way I talk about it, and my character, and my priorities, and my manner, does it make people hungry to see my homeland? Heaven. Man, I'm just a pilgrim. I'm a, just a temporary resident here. My homeland's in heaven. I'm looking for a city whose builder and whose maker is God. And I hope that my life makes people hungry to see that place. Because, friend, if you compare heaven with my friends, Greek island, that Greek island looks like the local rubbish heap. Heaven is amazing, and only redeemed people go there. If you want to come, I can introduce you to the king. I can get you papers, baby. <laughs> yeah, you can become an honorary citizen of my homeland. Yeah. And then there, there's a, a third footprint that we need to follow, and it's the footprint of sacrifice. Verse 17, same chapter, again, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, and Isaac, your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. God will, from time to time, test our faith by asking us to give up things that are precious to us. Asking us to give up for the sake of his kingdom things that are valuable to us. And... I have found that when I become attached to something, it seems to me God always puts his finger on it and asks me at some point to give it away. And I honestly don't, don't think it's just my, my view of God that I'm sort of superimposing on my life. I really think God does that from time to time, and so I try not to like my stuff too much. <laughs> because I never get to hang on to the stuff I really like. And so it's good to just sort of have a, a, a light touch on earthly things. Because the truth is, we're not taking any, any of it with us, right? I was golfing with a friend last week, and he had a Giants hat on. I said, you a San Francisco fan, huh? He says, oh, yeah. I said, well, I am too. Dodger fans don't get mad at me. I lived in the Bay Area as a little boy for a while. And my Aunt Tebbs, my dad's baby sister, she used to be a, a, a stewardess on Delta Airlines, and She'd bring me napkins from time to time, you know, with a personal message to me from Willie Mays on it. Those kind of things weren't uncommon. And one day, she brought a baseball to me, signed by the entire 1960 San Francisco Giants team. Philippe Lou, Juan Marichal, Willie McCovey, Willie Mays, the entire rest of the team. And so I'm telling this guy golfing, I said, hey, man, my, my aunt, Gave me a baseball in 1960. And listen, you'd, you'd be hard-pressed to go around planet Earth and try and find another one of those. 
He said, where is it? Do you still have it? He said, actually, no. Ended up in a heart for the house offering at Cottonwood. And in all honesty, not a big deal. Some sentimental value there, sure. Some monetary value, for sure. But you know what? It'll translate into lives being changed. I'm not taking the baseball to heaven with me, but I can take some souls to heaven with me. And throughout our journey, you know, God has, has dealt with Janet and I to, to sacrifice, if you would, but it, I almost don't like to use the word. You know, if an earthly king commissioned someone, you know, to, 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 to sacrifice all, you know, for the sake of the kingdom, we would consider it a great honor, and especially the guys, yes, you know, loyalty to the king, and we'll go out and do it, but hey, the king of kings has given us a commission. Why should we look at that as sacrifice rather than, than honor? Maybe we should call this the footprint of honor rather than the footprint of sacrifice. What an honor it is to sow something of value to us into eternity. We need to walk by faith and follow these footprints of faith. And the good news is, just like Abraham got Isaac back, you'll find out that whatever you sacrifice to God for the sake of his kingdom, one way or another, he always resurrects it and sends it back to you in multiplied form. That's just the way our God is. Hannah gave Samuel to the Lord. You know, she was barren before that. She kept her vow, gave him to the Lord. I think she had five other kids after that. That's just God's way. It comes back good. And running over, God pours it back. That is, that, is, that is just God's way. Now, he didn't settle up the first and the 15th of every month. <laughs> but eventually, it comes back into our life. And, and honestly, you know, I like to look at things in the light of eternity. I, I hope everything that I've, I've given comes back in this earthly life. But in reality, I've got an eternal perspective. Which brings us to the third and the final physical action that deals with faith, and that is running. 2 Timothy, look with me if you would, chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6. Paul said, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. Now he's talking about leaving this earthly life. I fought a good fight, or I fought the good fight. I've kept, or I finished the race. I've kept the faith. All right, he's talking about, man, I've, I've done this thing. My time is done. I've, I've run the race. I've kept the faith. The Message Bible puts it this way. I've run hard to the finish. Today's English version says, I've run the full distance. Now, standing in faith may deal with a single event, standing in the midst of a single storm. Walking deals with our, our daily, you know, living this out. But the race, that's a bigger perspective, perspective yet. That means step back and realize this is for a lifetime. Okay, you've had a setback. The race isn't over. Confusion and darkness and hard times come to all of us. Maybe you've had a setback. Maybe you've had a bad day. Maybe you've had a string of bad days. Maybe you've had a bad season. <laughs> well, you know what? The race is for the rest of your life. You are not done. If you'll keep going forward one foot in front of the other, day by day, month by month, year by year, friend, you will finish your race. <laughs> Maybe you're here. You have screwed up your life royally. Maybe you messed up your marriage. Maybe you were unfaithful, lost the love of your life. Maybe your kids don't speak to you to this day. Maybe you made some other wrong choices. All right, some of those things may not, maybe some of those relationships won't be restored in the way you would like to see them restored. But you know what? Even your blunders didn't take God by surprise. And he even takes those and weaves them into the fabric of our life, and he can make something beautiful out of them. And I'm telling you, get up and keep going. Your race is not over. A righteous man falls seven times and gets up again. The prophet said, do not rejoice over me, O my enemy, when I fall, for I shall arise. You've still got some more laps to run, baby. 
and we don't get rewarded for finishing first, second, or third. It's not a competition. You get rewarded for finishing. So just finish. Don't quit. Three things you need if you're going to go the full distance with your faith. You need purpose, patience, and need to realize there'll be a prize. Purpose. You need to live for something bigger than yourself. I quote you from the Living Bible, 1 Corinthians 9, 26. Paul said, so I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. I have a purpose. Bringing a living Jesus to a dying world. Winning people to Christ and then making disciples and raising up a young generation of leaders that, that can do this work with us. And when we're gone, carry it on after us. That's worth living for. If you don't have a, a, a purpose that's bigger than you, that's somehow tied into the kingdom, you won't finish well. You are meant for eternal things, whether it's supporting the work of God or whatever it might be. You have to have purpose in mind. Secondly, you need patience. Hebrews 12, 11, again, the Living Bible. Let us run with patience the particular race that God has set before us. Rome was not built in a day. A great ministry, a great marriage, a great company, great children, great relationships aren't built in a day. They take patience and loads of it. You know, Janet and I have been pastoring Cottonwood Church for 30 years. We didn't show up last Tuesday. <laughs> and there's been some amazing events and interventions of God that have accentuated and punctuated things along the journey, but most of it has just been one foot in front of the other for 30 years. You know, an acorn grows into a mighty oak tree. But it's hard to realize when you see the massive oak with its spreading boughs that it once was just an acorn that held its ground. A diamond is just a piece of coal that stuck to the job. And people with great lives that, that are, you know, like, like an oak or that shine like a diamond, they're people that have just stuck to the job and held their ground week after week, month after month, year after year. They kept trusting God and kept walking forward, refused to become, you know, part of the, the bitter, cynical crowd that didn't have anything good to say about anyone. They kept sweet in their spirit and just kept walking forward. And then thirdly, if you're going to finish and finish well, need to realize there's a prize. And I quote one more verse, Philippians 3.14, the Living Bible, I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God is calling us up to heaven because of what Christ Jesus did for us. A prize is waiting for all who finish. Not for those who finish first, but for those who finish. And I think there's going to be some great blessing and great reward in heaven. But I think the greatest of all is going to be joining in that chorus with the angels and with the elders around the throne whose number is 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands crying out with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb who is slain. He's worthy to receive honor and glory and power and strength and dominion. To join in that song and to gaze upon the Lamb of God, friend, that is reward enough. And that day is coming, surely as the dawn. I hope you'll be a part of it. You bow your heads and close your eyes if you would. Father, I pray blessing on your people. And I pray a special grace on those that have come in questioning, that have been battered down by the storms of life. Grace to them, Father, mercy to them. In Jesus' name. Now, if you're in the midst of a storm right now, standing and trusting. I want you to do something, just an outward sign that you're inwardly standing in your heart. Now, if that's you, and there's a particular deal going on in your life, I just want you to stand. Stand by your seat. Just a way to say, God, I'm standing. Standing on your faithfulness, standing. standing. Put your hands out in front of you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you 
You don't have to say this after me. I'm just going to pray. Let your heart go up to God. Father, we come in Jesus' name. We thank you for your promises that never fail. We thank you that you said we're not to forget all your benefits because you forgive all of our iniquities. You heal all of our diseases. You said that you supply all of our need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You said you'd lead us and guide us with your eye upon us. You said you'd surround us with favor like a shield and you'd cause even our enemies to be at peace with us. Father, we thank you that you are a God of reconciliation, a God of restoration. Lord, we stand, we, we tie the promises of God around our hearts right now. And we do indeed want to just lean back and enjoy the view. Thank you that you are a God who saves. Your arm is not short that it cannot save. Your eye is not dim, nor is your ear deaf. Thank you that you hear the cry of the righteous. And as we stand here physically, Heavenly Father, we are declaring that we are standing upon your word, and we believe you'll bring us through the storms we face. You'll bring us through, and you will rescue us. We trust you completely and totally, God. We trust you. We trust you with our loved ones. We trust you for our finances. We trust you with our health. We trust you with our futures. We trust you. I'd like everybody else to just stand up and join these that are standing, and I do want you to pray this after me. If you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, or if you're away from God, tie your heart around these words. Say it out loud. Say, oh God, I stand before you right now. For you sent your son to die in my place. Jesus, thank you for going to that cross. Taking the penalty of my sins upon yourself. I believe you paid for all of my sins. And were raised from the dead. And I ask you now, Jesus, come into my life. I confess you as Lord and Savior. I submit my heart and life to you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. You know, the Word of God does change things. The Bible says that God sent His Word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Paul said, now I commend you to God and to the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those that are sanctified. You know, David said, I, I called upon the Lord and he, he delivered me from all of my fears. And the Word of God set me free from the fear of my life. And friend, His Word can set you free from your fears. It can bring you through your difficulties. It can bring answers to you in your most desperate times. Have a love affair with your Bible. It will change your world. See you next time.